The Church of God at Corinth was established by Paul at the tail end of the second missionary tour. The Macedonian call brought Paul and his companions across the Aegean Sea to continental Europe. They established congregations in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. However, opposition to their preaching forced them south to the ancient and world-famous city of Athens. While a few were interested in Paul's preaching, most dismissed him. So Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, Acts 18, verse 1. In Corinth, Paul met the wonderful couple Aquila and Priscilla. While making tents to support himself, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks every Sabbath, Acts 18.4. The rest of his companions finally joined him, and he was able to redevote himself to preaching exclusively, says verse 5. The results were wonderful. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized, forming the congregation that Paul worked with for the next year and a half as he taught them the word of God, Acts 18, 8 through 11. Now, a few years later, Paul received a shocking report while in Ephesus during the third missionary journey. Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, 1 Corinthians 1, 11. This report, in conjunction with a letter the Corinthian church evidently wrote to Paul, was the impetus for the letter we call 1 Corinthians. The major premise of 1 Corinthians is established at the beginning of the letter. Now, Paul typically opened his epistles with an introduction and a prayer and then laid out the purpose of his writing. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Reunifying the body of Christ at Corinth was the apostle's primary objective in writing this letter. The first four chapters all deal with division and its consequences. Paul tried to reorient the way that they thought about the gospel, inspiration, the role of inspired preachers like himself and Apollos, and the way they viewed themselves as God's field, God's building, and God's holy temple. Starting in chapter 5, Paul moved to addressing specific moral issues, doctrinal errors, and a combination of theological and practical questions the Corinthians had. Siampa and Rossner offer this insight. In addition to supplying concrete answers to many problems which have comparable manifestations today on subjects as diverse as leadership, preaching, pluralism, sexuality, and worship, 1 Corinthians models how to approach the complexity of Christian living with the resources of the Old Testament and the example and teaching of Jesus. Above all, it shows the importance of asking, how does the gospel of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which enveloped the letter in chapters 1 and 15, teach us how to live? How true this is! The authority behind Paul's instructions was based on the person and work of Christ and the authority Jesus had entrusted to his apostles. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 24. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Chapter 15, verses 3 through 5. If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. Chapter 14, verse 37. For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. This is the center. This is the basis for Christian unity. It's about Jesus. And the Corinthians had forgotten that. 
They were so wrapped up in philosophical sophistry and fanciful argumentations that they forgot the simplicity of the gospel. They allowed socioeconomic differences to divide them. They accepted immorality into their midst because they thought it was noble to do so. Uh, they brought their conflicts to the Corinthian courts instead of working through them with the help of their brethren. They used their spiritual gifts to showboat instead of benefiting others. And all of this was because they forgot their common Savior and Redeemer. There are two lengthy sections in 1 Corinthians. The first is chapters 8 through 10, which is all about whether or not Christians can attend idol feasts. The second major uh, chunk is chapters 12 through 14, which is about the proper use of spiritual gifts. Now, in both of these sections, Paul essentially argues that neither of these matters would have been a problem for the Corinthian church if they had remembered the chief ethic of love. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 1 and 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. The Corinthians were wrong in their beliefs and practices on a range of issues, but it seems that the primary reason for their error was that instead of working together in love and unity, they were bitterly divided and filled with strife. How can a group of people ever work together towards a common good when they can't even stand being in the same room? The answer to this dilemma is Jesus. Make Christ the center of your life and your congregation. Let the love of Jesus guide you. Biblical love is doing what is spiritually best for others. Christians need to learn the lesson of 1 Corinthians, that Christianity is not about us as individuals. It's about the gospel of Christ manifested through us in the love we show for one another.